Father in heaven, we pray the presence of your Spirit today. Lord, speak to our hearts and to our minds that we would understand and that we would have hope in any situation in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to talk to you about a story today. We're just going to mostly read through a Bible story, and I'm just going to make some comments as we go along. It starts in Acts chapter 27. So Acts chapter 27, verse 1, says, When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. All right, so let me give you context here. Paul goes, after his third missionary journey, goes back to Jerusalem and gets arrested. Then he's put in prison and he's held for a long time and, and the, the leaders of the Jews keep coming and making charges against him, but the Romans can't see any reason why they should do anything to him. So they just kind of hold him there until he makes an appeal to Caesar. And once he appeals to Caesar, uh, once the governor decides to grant that appeal, now it is the governor's responsibility to send him to Rome to appear before Caesar because Paul's a Roman citizen. So when it says we, it's understood that Acts was written by Luke. So Luke is with Paul, and there's a whole little entourage of them that are there. But Paul is a prisoner. Now I want you to notice this first verse. So when it was decided we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. So Paul was somewhat of a different kind of prisoner, but he was kind of just a prisoner, right? And he just got handed over to a centurion who has one job, and his job is to get the prisoners in his charge to Rome or to die trying. Because what happens to a prison guard if he lets a prisoner escape? In those days, you died. If you let the prisoner go, it was your life for doing it. So Julius and his group have one job, get this group of prisoners to Rome. And in that context, Paul's just one of those guys. But here's, here's what I want you to, to think about as we go forward. When you are God's servant, there is no such thing as a situation so bad you can't still be a blessing. Right now, Paul's just one of the servants, one, uh, one of the prisoners. But watch what happens here. Verse 2, we boarded a ship from Adramitium about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we set out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. So now I've got a little map here so you'll understand what's going on. So it starts down here in the corner at Caesarea. That's where he was held. And then they go up to Sidon and Julius lets the people of Sidon who know Paul give him some supplies. And then they sail up around Cyprus just off coast from Antioch, where Paul has spent all that time. I wonder if he gazed towards the shore as they went by. And then past Tarsus, that's where he's from, right? And sailed on around past Pamphylia, that's the region where he went on his first missionary journey. And finally they get to Myra in Lycia. So now verse 6. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Canidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Salmone, and we moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. All right, so let's take a look at that. So, so Myra, they get onto a different ship, and they head to Rhodes and to Canidus. And now they want to cut across and get to Italy. You see Italy all the way over there on the left. But as they're heading out, the winds are not favorable. And it blows them more on a southwestern, uh, a southwestern course. They come down to Crete by Salmone, and then they head around the bottom side to Fair Havens. Okay, now verse 9. 
Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement takes place in the fall. And in those days, remember, they're sailing. They don't have steam power. They don't have any other kind of power. So you only go when the wind blows. And when the wind blows the wrong way, it's really hard to go. And as the fall of the year draws into winter, the winds are not favorable anymore for travel. So Paul warned them, verse 10, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Now we hear that and we think, what an idiot, he didn't listen to Paul. But I want you to stop and step back for a second. You're Julius. You're a centurion. You have a group of prisoners, and one of them seems to be a know-it-all about sailing on the sea. He says, don't go. But the owner of the ship and the pilot are saying, no, no, we can do this. This is no problem. Who are you going to listen to? Well, at this point, Julius would have had to been incredibly intuitive or a total fool to put his fortunes with a prisoner instead of the captain of the ship, right? One of the greatest challenges of leadership is discerning which expert is the right expert to listen to when you need to make a decision. It would have seemed that the expert you wanted was the maritime expert, but it turns out in this case the expert you wanted was the one who knows God really well. Verse 12. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northeast. So let's look at our map again here, and I'll show you. So they came down, they were at Fair Havens, and do you see on the island of Crete, there's a little town there named Phoenix. They wanted to go to that edge of the island because it was safer for winter. Now, when a gentle, verse 13, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. So the wind's blowing gently from the south. That means they're not going to get blown out to sea. They're going to run along the edge of of the coast and duck into that next port. Verse 14, before long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. So they're heading across, and all of a sudden the wind comes from the land incredibly hard, and they're blown away from the land, and they can't get back. This is a scary moment. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. Verse 16, as we passed to the lee of a small island called Cotta, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. This must have been a really significant event because Luke really took time to detail it. Verse 17, so the men hoisted it, the lifeboat aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. That'd make you a little nervous, wouldn't it? Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbar of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. So they're no longer in control. They have no idea what's going on. They don't know exactly where they are, so they just hang an anchor off the back, hoping that if they get into shallow water, it'll catch before they get stuck. Verse 18, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. The crew needs this. This is what they work with. This is how they make their living. But they're so scared, they just threw it in the ocean. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. You ever felt like that? Finally gave up all hope. Verse 21, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. (laughs) Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage 
because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong. Isn't that a neat phrase? Who is the God to whom you belong? Have you given yourself in whole to the God of heaven to the point where you could say at a time like this, the God to whom I belong? See, I think this was the great strength of David. Despite all his foolishness and all the stuff he did, he belonged to God. He was given over wholly to him. I love that line, but but let's go on here. Verse 23, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. Okay, let me pause right there. The Lord, if you belong to the Lord and you are serving the Lord with your life, the Lord will not allow your life to end until you have accomplished everything he has appointed for you. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when the trials of life come because God will make sure you're able to do everything he has appointed you to do. And if you have successfully gotten to the end of what the Lord has appointed you to do, then thankfully take rest. Because that means you have lived the life that God called you to live. Verse 24, And said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So now let me ask you the question I asked you again. At the beginning of chapter 27, a whole bunch of prisoners got on a ship with a centurion who was a pretty important guy and soldiers with him and maybe some other passengers that seemed significant somehow. And there was a captain of the ship, and there was an owner of the ship. But now, when it comes down to the middle of the storm, who is the most important person on the ship? It's Paul, isn't it? Because Paul has a purpose, and he is on mission for God, and God in His graciousness has granted the lives of everyone else that's with him because they're with him. The very presence of a believer in the midst of unbelievers can be a means by which grace comes to unbelievers. The ship was full of pagans, but they received grace from God because there was a faithful believer in their midst. So be faithful, right? in whatever setting you're in, because the grace of God can come to everyone around just because you're there and because you belong to God and because you serve God. And God in His graciousness and in His honor of you will sometimes give you, the people around you, preserve their lives as well because of your faithfulness. Verse 27, On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed that that we were approaching land, that they were approaching land. I wonder how they knew that. You ever wonder how much knowledge gets lost? You know, there are things that that people do routinely, and, and so in these days they sailed on these waters, and they had ways of sensing, even in the night, and in the midst of a storm, that they were approaching land. I wonder how they knew that. Anymore, we have to have a chart. We have to have a GPS. We have to have something else to show us. But there was something they knew. Something about the water, I suppose. Verse 28, they took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Suddenly everybody becomes a believer in a crisis, right? So let's look at the map again. So we went to Fair Havens. They didn't stay like Paul said. Now they're just blown across the Mediterranean Sea. Nobody knows exactly where all they went, but they headed all the way across past the, the bottom part of Italy 
underneath Sicily to the tiny island of Malta. Let's keep reading. Verse 30. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. How treacherous was that? See, the sailors said, this ship is lost, but we have a chance to get out of here. Let's drop the lifeboat, and we can get the lifeboat over the rocks, and we can get to shore. Whatever happens to them, who cares? It's pretty treacherous, isn't it? Verse 31, then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Okay, who's everybody listening to now? Right? Along At the beginning, it was like, who is this crazy man talking? Now he says, no, you better not trust those sailors. Cut that boat loose because if they don't stay with this ship, you can't survive. And they didn't even ask questions. They just cut them loose. The prisoner is now giving the orders. Verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. All together, there were 276 of us on board. It's nice that there was no recriminations from Paul. He said, let everybody eat. It'll be good. Verse 38, when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. Now, verse 42 is important here. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. It was the soldiers' responsibility to get those prisoners where they needed to go. And if any of them got away, it was their life. So rather than take a chance, you kill them. That's how it works. But look what has happened. Verse 43, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. So look how things have changed, right? Ordinary prisoner to a man that the centurion is defending. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. When you are God's servant, there is no such thing as a situation so bad that you can't be a blessing. He starts out a prisoner, but now they're putting their confidence in him. Acts 28, verse 1, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us, all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out of the heat, fastened itself on his hand. Ever had a day like that? You've been in a storm for two weeks. You got shipwrecked. You're finally starting to get some respect from the crew. You decide to help out a little bit and throw some firewood, and you get bit by a snake. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to leave. Interesting Maltese theology here. Uh, There was a Roman god named Eustitia, from which we get the word justice. She was the god that didn't let you get off if you did something bad. There was two Greek gods, Themis, the god of divine order, and Dike, the the god of the traditional order. They were kind of gods as well like this. It was almost a karma concept. So the people on the island said, he must be a bad man. But you see, Paul is a man of the god of heaven. 
And nothing happens to Paul unless God allows it, right? Verse 4, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. You can imagine they were watching him. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to them, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. A little bit fickle, but they were doing the best with what they had, I guess. Verse 7, there was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and, after praying, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we need. So Paul the prisoner arrives on the island of Malta, heals the father of the main man on the island, heals all the sick on the island. All the people on the island bring him the things he needs. They spend winter in a lovely place with a people who care about them, who take care of them, who listen to the things they say, who honored Paul. Contrast that with the beginning. Acts 27.1, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners, that's all who he is at that point, were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. But now 28 verse 10, the end of the story. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So here's the point. Just because you are a shipwrecked prisoner, don't think that God isn't with you. And when God is with you, you will be a blessing best thing that ever happened to the people of Malta during that era was when Paul's ship, Paul the prisoner, got shipwrecked on their island. So here's the application. Here's what you got to take home. Don't let your circumstance steal your hope. I'm a prisoner. What can I do? I, I'm not even a sailor, and I'm in the midst of a storm, and they're afraid. What can I do? Don't let your circumstance seal your hope. You belong to God. Trust in Him, and He will enable you to be a blessing regardless of your circumstances. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to have this trust and faith that we might go into the world as the people who belong to You, And believe that your grace will make a difference everywhere we go. Help us not look to our circumstances, but believe that even in a shipwreck, you will bring great good through us. In Jesus' name, amen.